Good morning, CCC, and welcome to our online Sunday service. It is already the end of May of 2021. We thank the Lord that He has always been faithful throughout our, all of the various circumstances that has happened in the past year. Thank the Lord that He gives us the strength to conduct our lives according to His gospel message. And we thank the Lord to give us the power to now repent from all of our sins. Today is the Lord's Day. A day especially made for us Christians to celebrate Him, particularly and corporately, for us to cast our happiness and sorrow, anxiety and joy, all that is within our hearts, before Him, for not only that He is good, but He is with us and He loves us so. And before we begin, let us pray. Our Father, we come before you, all that we are. You know all of the conditions of our hearts more than we do. Yet, despite all of our sin, you gather us here under the banner of our, of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has come and died for our sins uh, to celebrate you as the purpose of our existence. Today, we ask for the faith that all the power that is at work within us is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And this power is here to sanctify us to love you more today than yesterday. Bless our worship today in all of the scripture reading, all of our confessions, all of our singing, that your name might be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We start our worship every Sunday with the call to worship. The call to worship calls us to step into his holy place by reminding us who God is, fully displayed in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it reminds us that we are His people, being called from the wilderness to worship Him so. Our call to worship today is taken from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 to 21. Let us read aloud our call to worship together. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him, who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To Him be glory in the Church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.
body lay Light of the world by darkness slain Then bursting forth in glorious day Up from the grave he rose again And as he stands in victory There are many reasons why people like you or me go to church. Some of us might come in order to fill, fill some sort of religious obligation, right? to feel good about ourselves, knowing we fulfilled our responsibility. Others might come seeking miraculous deliverance or divine counsel, because maybe we're facing something that we really can't deal with on our own. There are also those who are here or at church seeking community wanting to find a place where they feel like they belong and are significant, or any other number of reasons. And these reasons aren't necessarily bad, nor impossible uh, to find a church. But in our call to worship that we just read, Paul's beautiful prayer, we saw what he hoped that we as Christians were, would receive as God's people. What every church should really be hoping its members receive through our ministry. And he says, that it is that each of us may be strengthened in our inner being by the riches of the glory of God, and that through faith Christ dwells in our hearts, such that we're rooted and grounded in His love. And the result of this, that we begin to experience the breadth and width and length and height and depth of the love of Christ that surpasses understanding, such that we are filled with the fullness of God, then everything else in our lives will sort itself out, kind of. Why? Because God is able to do far more abundantly than we can ever ask or think. In other words, what we, should we want from church and from our Christianity is to be able to be in awe of the glory of God. That we're able to fully appreciate how big and powerful and loving our God is. And that we become increasingly aware that this God is not far off, but here, dwelling with us in our hearts, that we may be strengthened through His spiritual presence of Christ and to be able to truly know God, and that we may see God as bigger than our problems and infinitely more valuable than anything that we can ask for. Friends, it is only through being filled with all the fullness of God in this way is it possible for us to experience the benefits of going to church, for us to really understand the true value of being Christian. 
Because if our religious activities, our church going, our Bible reading, does not see this deepening of our love for God as the highest good, we will un inevitably be unsatisfied with our religion. For if our religious works is motivated, is not motivated, rather, at its core by this genuine love for God, even if we try very hard to be religious, follow every rule and make every effort to modify every, uh, our behavior, uh, go to every activity, every retreat, every Bible study, the best we can hope for if we don't love God is this cosmetic appearance of wisdom and godliness. Yet our hearts that loves ourselves and indulging our sinful desires above all will remain unchanged. And we actually end up missing the point of these religious activities in obedience to God. Always being around the truth, but never getting it. So when we're not getting whatever benefit we think we can derive from God, we either would just stop trying because keeping up this Christian life is pretty hard, or we just go somewhere else to find a church and a religion that makes us feel free to indulge in our desire, um, desires, makes us feel we're, like we're justified in our own ways, tell us something that we actually want to hear. Because if we don't love God, we never really wanted what God is actually trying to offer. Freedom from our sins a new nature, a new spirit that is no longer controlled by our desires and selfishness, whereby our hearts is freed, are freed to be truly capable of loving um, God and not only ourselves. So read with me our confession of sin taken from 2 Timothy, where Paul was warning Timothy um, about the kind of people in his church, and which actually prophetically describes the state of the church in, our, uh, in the last days, right? which, is, which includes today. Listing out the conditions of the heart, the sinful behaviors that will persist if we are not rooted in the love of God. Taken from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7, and 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. This is the word of God. But understand this, that... In the last days, there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning, but never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. And 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 and 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Let us confess how we have often failed to love the Lord our God and have been led astray by our various passions in our silent prayers of confession. Father in heaven, we confess, Lord, that we often do not seek you. We often are still led by our desires and we do not reflect the salvation which you have brought from us. Father, let us not be satisfied, Lord. Prevent us from being satisfied in our sins. 
that we may truly hunger and thirst for you. Uh, we repent, Lord, for taking for granted your word that, that instructs us. We repent for using your word for our good. But Father, allow us to realize um, the lack of love we have for you and through your Holy Spirit. Give us uh, a renewed and refreshed desire for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, every single one of us still feels the seemingly irresistible pull of our sinful desires. And perhaps some of us are feeling pretty nervous or questioning our love of God, uh, whether or not it's genuine, since we've sinned so much and want to sin so badly. But here's the good news. God's love for us is more powerful than our sin. That while we are still sinners, God made us holy. Before we were worthy, Jesus set us free by taking our place on the cross and sending us his spirit. So if we persevere in this fight against sin by abiding in his word, it means that we're already freed, which means if we believe in him, we have been made capable of enjoying the true prize of our faith, to know our Lord, the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, which surpasses understanding. So here now, your assurance of pardon taken from John, Chapter 8, verse 31, 32, 34, 236. This is the word of God. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, the sun remains forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Brothers and sisters, I implore you to live in this freedom. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, that through your grace and through your Holy Spirit, that we may be able to realize the, the surpassing grace that you have given to us, Lord, the, the incredible privilege and freedom to know you. Lord, refresh our souls, feed our souls when we pursue you and make the things of earth ever more dim that we may continue to be steadfast in our walk with you, though there are many temptations. You have given us more than enough to persevere. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. flesh and bone but in the costly wounds of love at the cross my worth is not in skill or name in win or lose in pride or shame but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him. Eternal calls to us at the cross.
wisdom's fleeting light But I will boast in knowing Christ at the cross I rejoice, I rejoice in my Redeemer Greatest treasure and wellspring of my soul Trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. Two wonders here that I confess my worth and my unworthiness. My value fixed, my ransom paid at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul. Satisfied in Him alone, my soul is satisfied in Him alone, my soul is satisfied in Him Our statement of faith today is taken from Belgian Confession, Article 29. Please read out loud with me. Article 29 of the Marks of the True Church. We believe that we ought to discern diligently and very carefully from the Word of God what is the true church. For all sects which are in the world today claim for themselves the name of church. We are not speaking here of the hypocrites who are mixed in the church along with the good and yet are not part of the church, although they are outwardly in it. We are speaking of the body and the communion of the true church, which must be distinguished from all sects that call themselves the church. The true church is to be recognized by the following marks. It practices the pure preaching of the gospel. It maintains the pure administration of the sacraments as Christ instituted them. It exercises church discipline for correcting and punishing sins. In short, it governs itself according to the pure word of God, rejecting all things contrary to it, and regarding Jesus Christ as the only head. Hereby, the true church can certainly be known, and no one has the right to separate from it. Those who are of the church may be recognized by the marks of Christians. They believe in Jesus Christ, the only Savior, flee from sin, and pursue righteousness. Love the true God and their neighbor without turning to the right or left and crucify their flesh and its works. Although great weakness remains in them, they fight against it by the Spirit all the days of their life. They appeal constantly to the blood, suffering, death, and obedience of Jesus Christ, in whom they have forgiveness of their sins through faith in Him. The false church assigns more authority to itself and its ordinances than to the Word of God. It does not want to submit itself to the yoke of Christ. It does not administer the sacraments as Christ commanded in His Word but adds to them and subtracts from them as it pleases. It bases itself more on men than on Jesus Christ. It persecutes those who live holy lives according to the word of God and who rebuke the false church for its sins, greed, and idolatries. These two churches are easily recognized and distinguished from each other. 
Good morning, Covenant City Church. As usual, let us now continue in our worship through the giving of our tithes and offering. The gospel calls us to grow in generosity, and not only that, it also gives us the power to grow in generosity. I just want to remind and encourage all of you that in Christ, He, the God of the universe, has been generous unto undeserving sinners like us, so that now in Christ, we are able to uh, grow and show the world what generosity looks like. And one of the ways that we show that is through the giving of our tithes and offering, through the giving of God's kingdom's work in and through the local church. So if you are a member of Covenant City Church, I do want to lovingly remind you that it is both a duty and delight for us to give unto CCC. But if you're not a member of Covenant City Church, please, I do want to encourage you to give unto the local church that you are a member of. Here are several ways that you can give to CCC. If you do have any questions regarding giving, please do feel free to reach out to us. Let me pray for our tithes and offering and also go into our time of intercessory prayer. I invite you to pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we can grow in generosity, Lord. Uh, we know that uh, our hearts love uh, to prioritize the self more so than others. And we fall into that temptation more so than not. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would use this time as a way to sanctify us, that you may remind us of the story of redemption, that you, a God who owns everything and who doesn't have to save undeserving sinners like us, have shown us mercy in and through your Son. So, Father, I pray that your people may grow in generosity in giving uh, to the local church and also uh, to grow in that with their love for one another. And Father, as we go into our time of intercessory prayer, Lord, not only for generosity, but we pray for growth in church unity and discipleship. And we know, Father, for the past year, uh, being isolated from one another, it has been a challenging uh, work for us. And Father, I pray that you, through your spirit, through the Bible studies and through community groups and all the programs that you have uh, given to us, Lord, that members, that one of uh, all of us, Lord, may grow uh, in relationship with one another and ultimately in our uh, love and obedience unto you. And Father, on that note, we pray for the sustenance for church leaders and staff, especially for leaders and staff in CCC, Lord, that they may continue to care for the members faithfully and effectively. Guard their hearts, Lord, from burnout, but rather fill their hearts with the gospel rest and confidence that could only come from your spirit indwelling in their hearts. And Father, last uh, but not least, we also pray for our opening plans in August, Lord. There are still many uncertain things that uh, still could happen in the next one or two months, but I pray, Father, uh, that you may uh, bring an end to the pandemic here in Indonesia so that, Lord, churches may be able to gather together again and for us to be able to fellowship with one another again. And Father, uh, we pray also for the government workers, medical workers, Lord, who are working uh, tirelessly to bring an end to this. And Father, we thank you. We look unto you, Lord, as the source of our hope, as the source of our comforts. And Father, we pray that you may continue to do your work in and through us. Father, we end this time of intercessory prayer in the way that you've taught your disciples to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, four quick announcements before we continue in our scripture reading and our uh, sermon for today. The first one is um, something I've been wanting to do for a long time, but only am now able to do it, is I want to start uh, to lead marriage groups for Covenant City Church members. Uh, this is for any Covenant City Church member uh, who is married um, uh, for a few months or a few years, it doesn't matter. Uh, we'd love to I'd love to get together with you and just talk about some of the biblical principles of marriage, uh, maybe go through a book about marriage. I don't know exactly how it's going to look like group-wise. Um, am I going to be leading one big group or is it going to be small groups? Uh, it's going to be highly dependent on the number of people that sign up. So let's start here. If you are a Covenant City Church member uh, and, and you're married and you want to be part of this, please email covenantcityc 
at gmail.com, covenantcdc at gmail.com. And then based on however many of you sign up, we'll, we'll set the, um, the structure accordingly. And for now, I do wanna just keep it to Covenant City Church members um, or those who are really seriously planning on joining Covenant City Church as members uh, because we don't wanna open it too wide right now. But if there aren't many people, members that sign up, uh, then we'll let you guys know and we can open it up to more than just members, all right? So please sign up for that if that's something that you uh, would like to be a part of. Second announcement is Ask the Preacher. Uh, you guys probably remember, uh, this is something we did a while back when uh, on Sundays at 3 p.m. after the service, uh, the preachers, me or whoever is preaching that Sunday, would go online and you guys would be able to sign in into the Zoom room that we're in and ask us any questions you might have about the particular passage sermon that Sunday or just anything at all. Since we're gonna be ending uh, Romans today, it's our last series today, we do wanna do that today at 3 p.m. Uh, so please come and join uh, us. Um, and, and the information of, of how to get there can be found in, this, in the link in this YouTube video, also in different WhatsApp groups or in our Instagram as well um, about how to join uh, Ask the Preacher. So please come 3 p.m. today and ask us any questions about Romans, this particular passage, or just um, anything about the Christian life at all. We'd love to dialogue with you about that. Third is a, a reminder, there is no Ibadah Sore today. There's no afternoon service today uh, because I know it's usually once every other week, but it's really the first and the third Sunday of the month. Uh, and because there's five weeks this month, we're not having it uh, now on the fifth Sunday. So we're gonna have it next week, um, which is the first Sunday of, of June. So please join us and, and come and worship God with us at our Ibadah Sore next Sunday at 5 p.m. and this YouTube channel as well. Um, and the last one is just the connect card. If you guys wanna get connected more and get more plugged in with the church, we encourage you to uh, scan this QR code and then uh, come and give us information, whatever you wanna give about how to contact you, we'll contact you and then we can get you plugged in through our Bible study, community groups, or different book readings or programs that we have. So please, please come uh, and do that and, and, uh, and join the church in that way. All right, let me uh, pray for us and then we'll continue in our scripture reading and our sermon for today. Let's pray. Father, as we close the book of Romans, I pray that you would uh, tell us and reveal to us what it is you want us to learn from this last, very last part of the letter and that we would grow in our, in our love for you and our love for the gospel and hopefully emulate and follow the life that Paul lived as one who um, was consumed by, by your love and by the gospel. Um, change our lives as you did his with the same gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our sermon today is taken from Romans 16, verse 17 to 27. Here is the word of God. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who was host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus greet you. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation, of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thus says the Lord. Friends, this will be our last sermon in the book of Romans. And it's been a journey. We've unpacked a lot this past year through uh, the book of Romans. Paul's talked about human sin, God's holy laws, God's justice, God's mercy and kindness, and how all of that stuff really points to the good news of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, 
so that we who daily break God's laws and deserve God's justice could instead receive mercy and kindness. That's what the whole book really is about, right? That the gospel message and Paul packed all these truths up in the first 15 chapters. And now at the end of the last chapter of the letter, Paul is telling the Christians in Rome to preserve this gospel truth that he's been teaching for the past 15 chapters and then to share them to those who've never heard, right? Paul's saying that is the task of the church. Our task is to keep and share everything that we learned the past year through Romans and share it to those who's never heard. Now, how do we do that? Well, as we saw last Sunday, the first half of chapter 16, Paul says we can do that by staying united, right? When different Christians from different churches and different cultures and different walks of life come together, love one another, accept one another, work with one another, right? That's how the gospel message will advance. But what we just read today in the second half of chapter 16, it's a bit unexpected because it almost feels like Paul is saying the exact opposite of what he said in the first half of chapter 16, right? If in the first half of chapter 16, Paul says the church can preserve and advance the gospel by accepting one another, here he's saying that the church must also, pre must also preserve and advance the gospel by avoiding some people. Look at verse 17. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, Paul says. And this might sound counterintuitive intuitive to us because we're used to, you know, uh, the idea of unity. We're very comfortable with the idea of unity. And, and to avoid people, that just sounds very exclusive, right? And, and as Christians, the last one we want to be is exclusive, but Paul clearly says here, avoid some people. So there, there's this really fine line that we're called to walk between accepting one another and avoiding some. And it's a hard line to walk, isn't it? Who to accept, who to avoid, how to do it, when to do it, with what kind of intensity do I do it? You know, it's all really confusing. And, and historically, the church hasn't really done a good job in, in, in figuring this out but we got to figure it out. If we love the gospel message, if we love the people around us, want, we want them to hear the gospel message, if we want this message to go to the ends of the earth, we got to figure this out. we got to walk this fine line between acceptance and avoidance. And that's, that's what this passage is about. Three things that I want to point out about this fine line of acceptance and avoidance. The nuance, the difficulty, and the courage the nuance, the difficulty, and the courage. First point, the nuance. Okay, we got to be clear about why Paul was so concerned about avoiding some people. And it's not because he was just wanting to be divisive or because he had this superior, you know, heart over other people, but it's because he really, really cares about the purity of the gospel message. Look, if your kid's sick, and you go to the doctor, right? And you're being extra vigilant about what medicine the doctor puts in your kid's body. And you're asking all these questions, making sure nothing bad gets in. That's not you being difficult. That's just you really caring about your kid. And as Christians, we should really care about the purity of the gospel message. So we should be vigilant, right? When necessary. And make sure that we, we create distinction and avoid certain people who are twisting the gospel and changing it into something that it's not. And I get how this can make people nervous because in the past, you know, pastors preach on things like this and it's caused a lot of division, a lot of destruction in the church and it destroys church unity. So how do we do this? How do we keep the principle of Christian unity that Paul talked about in the first half of chapter 16, but also obey the command here to avoid some people, okay? First, you got to know who you're called to avoid, okay? That's the first principle. It's not just everyone you have the slightest theological difference with or every church you have the slightest theological difference with. Remember, two chapters ago in chapter 14, Paul clearly says, stop quarreling over small differences, right? Some might count different days more holy than others, or some think it's okay to eat some meat, some things, it's not okay to drink some things. Just welcome one another, that's okay, right? Keep the unity. Who you're called to avoid here are not uh, everyone you disagree with, it's people who are preaching something so utterly erroneous that Paul says it's reached the level of being contrary to the doctrine of the gospel. And that's a phrase Paul uses here, and I'm quoting a commentator, that's a phrase Paul would use to describe somebody who's preaching a message that would lead to damnation, the commentator says. Okay, so it's, it's not just 
anyone. Some, it's only people who are in really, really big gospel error. But second, you're also not supposed to do this to those who are not Christians. Look, if someone's not a, clearly not a Christian and they're preaching something contrary to the gospel, that's just, of course, that's expected. That's obvious. You're not called to avoid them. The Bible calls you to love them, to build a relationship with them so that you can dialogue with them about the gospel, right? This command to avoid is specifically for people who are claiming to be Christians but are preaching something contrary to the gospel. Look at verse 17 to 18 again. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ. Now, now think about that. The fact that Paul had to clarify, look, these guys, they don't serve our Lord Christ. That should tell you that they maybe look like they might be serving our Lord Christ. You see, or else Paul wouldn't need to clarify that these guys aren't actually serving Jesus Christ. So these people probably looked pretty Christian. They talked Christian, they dressed Christian, they acted Christian, they claimed to be Christian. They most likely met to worship uh, uh, Sunday mornings. Uh, they would use Bible verses, right, and throw that out in their worship services. They would sing songs to the God of the Bible, and they would say phrases like, in the name of Jesus. But when you see the content of their preaching, it's not the gospel that they're preaching. So it can be confusing. And, and here's one way you can identify them. Paul, Paul does give us a hint here. Usually, in their worship services, in their preachings, in, in, in the songs that they sing, the concept of sin usually would not be found. It would be avoided altogether. They wouldn't really talk about that. Look at verse 18. Here's the hint. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. By smooth talk and flattery, these people specialize in flattery, okay? So they will lift you off your feet with their words. And what they say will feel like honeydew to the taste buds of your soul. And they'll package it all with Christian jargon. And you'll be so confused because how can something that feels so good and sounds so Christian be so wrong? But here's the tell. Here's the tell. They will never love you enough to tell you that you are a sinner. They will never love you enough to tell you that your only hope in life and death is if the God of the universe himself takes care of business for you by paying the ultimate sacrifice and dying on the cross for your sins. You and I are just that helpless. They're, they'll never tell you that because they don't care about you. They care about your money, your approval, your praises. So they'll flatter you to death because by doing so, they'll continue to serve their own appetites, Paul says here in verse 18. So, recap. One, in order to avoid certain people for the sake of the gospel without being destructive to the call of Christian unity, one, be careful to who you put in this category, right? We're supposed to love and accept most Christians, uh, even if there's small differences. It's, it's those who, have, who are preaching something contrary to the gospel. Careful who you put in this category. Two, th this isn't meant to be applied to blatant non-Christians. It is expected that non-Christians would preach something contrary to the gospel. These are from people who look like they're serving Jesus, but really aren't, okay? People who claim to be a Christian church, but are preaching something contrary to the gospel. And the third principle here that we see is that, okay, when you meet the people in this, in this circle, you're not called to hold every single person in that camp equally responsible. You're not called to avoid every single one of them equally. Okay, look at verse 18 again. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. You hear that? Paul's saying here that a lot of people in this camp, they're actually the deceived naive. They're not the perpetrators. They're the ones who are being deceived. 
Have mercy on these people, Paul says. Care for them, love them. Think about it. If you're a low-income single mother and you don't really know much about the Bible and you live in this impoverished part of the world, you know, and you don't know when your child's next meal is going to come from, and here comes someone flying in in a private jet, right, saying, believe in the Bible, you know, if you tithe this much to my church, the Lord's going to return your money hundredfold and you're never going to be able, you're never going to have to think about what your kid's going to eat again. What will you do? There are people in this camp, Paul says, who aren't as guilty and you shouldn't hold them equally accountable. The ones who you're supposed to avoid and hold accountable are those who are doing the manipulating, not the ones being manipulated. Okay? Avoid and rebuke those who are doing the manipulating, but love and care for those who are being manipulated. All right? Those are the three principles here that we see in this passage about how we can avoid some for the sake of gospel purity, but also keep the spirit of, of Christian unity. You see how the target here about who to avoid becomes smaller and smaller, right? It's not every Christian in every church, right? It's just those who are pushing contrary to the gospel. It's, it's not even non-believers, right, that, that are pushing something contrary to the gospel. It's just those who claim to be Christians who are pushing something contrary to the gospel. And even in that camp, it's not everybody there, just those who are doing the manipulating, just those who are doing uh, the false teaching, not the naive hearts that are being deceived. Distinct yourselves from them, Paul says, right? Don't just randomly shoot your heresy shotgun everywhere. Okay, be very specific in where and how you draw that line. But you have to. You have to when necessary. However, it is much easier said than done, which leads us to our second point, the difficulty of doing this. Why is it so hard to draw this line? Well, it's because no one wants to be a mean Christian. That, that's really it. Who wants to be that guy, right? Who wants to be, you know, the theological policeman? No, no one does. And look, it's not necessarily a bad thing that you don't want to be that. It's not bad that you're not excited about being a theological policeman. Even Paul says here to the Roman Christians in verse 19, for your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent, as to what is evil. What Paul is saying here is that, look, your obedience is known to all. That's, that's good. You're good people, Roman Christians. Okay, you've got issues, sure, but overall, you're good people, your obedience is known to all, you're humble, you're kind, and I rejoice over that. You know, that's not a bad thing. But, he continues to say, that also is what can make you an easy target for these false teachers. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent, as to what is evil. There's, there's a play on concepts here, the concept of being innocent in verse 19, with the concept of being naive we saw earlier in verse 18. Remember Paul said earlier that these people deceive the hearts of the naive, and now here he's saying be innocent to what is evil. What, what he's saying here is that there's a thin line between being innocent and being naive. Your goodness and your innocence, it, it's a good thing. I rejoice over that. But it can be a double-edged sword. Paul is saying, it could make you, for lack of better phrase to describe it, it could make you a little bit too nice, you see, a little bit too hesitant to draw that line. And by doing so, you're letting people into the mix who really shouldn't have been let in. And when you do that, some voices that really have no business being on the pulpit will end up having a platform and will end up having a lot of power in defining what Christianity is to the culture that you're in. Uh, let me ask you, why is it that in our country, hundreds and thousands of people flock to these quote-unquote Christian worship services where the quote-unquote pastor is selling oil for physical healing and asking people to, to give them their money as an investment for financial blessing in return? Like, when did that start becoming okay? And they're doing all of it in the name of Jesus? What an insult to the name of Jesus. 
How did that lie start to become the truth of Christianity? I'll tell you why. It's because someone somewhere failed to draw the line. And then someone else failed. And then someone else failed. And then a few failed lines later, we have what we have today. Look, it's, it's good to be kind-hearted. It's good to be gentle, patient, peaceful, self-controlled, all the fruit of the Spirit, right? Keep that about you. I rejoice over that, Paul says. But for the sake of the gospel, you got to figure out when and how to draw that line without losing the fruit of the Spirit. How to draw that line while remaining gentle and patient and peaceful and kind and self-controlled, you see. It's a complicated exercise, but you got to do it. You got to do it. And this isn't just an exercise for pastors. Church members, you are called to do this as well. In Galatians chapter 1, when false teachers started to enter into the church, Paul there holds the whole church accountable, not just the pastors and the elders and the deacons, the whole church. To the churches in Galatia, Paul says, I'm astonished that you, and the you here is plural, really y'all, right? Kalian, not kamu, but kalian semua. I'm, I'm astonished that you all are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are returning to a different gospel. If anyone is preaching to you all a gospel contrary to the one you all received, let him be accursed. It's y'all's responsibility, everyone, to draw the line, church members too. You know, and don't believe, church members, that you don't have any power or weight in, in the health of the church. You're the one voting for the elders. You're the ones voting for the deacons. Your tithes is what's paying the salary for the church staff. You have a lot of power in the church. And if those who have a lot of power don't know their Bibles, if those who have a lot of power don't embody the gospel, that can be a problem. And that can affect the direction of the whole church. But I, I do understand. I, t I get it. If I wasn't a pastor, I don't know if... I if I would, you know, I probably would be tempted to avoid this responsibility as well. I would, you know, because what you'll find happening when you try to obey this command is that a lot of people will, will start to caricature you as being exclusive. A lot of people will blame you for being prideful, divisive, you know. It, it's just one of those commands that when you obey it, it's hard. You know, it's not going to make you popular, which leads us to our last point. Where can we get the courage to be able to obey this command? Leads us to our third point, the courage. A lot of you guys who are listening to this, you know me. Uh, and for those of you who really know me, you would know that I have the tendency towards people pleasing. I, I really do. So in light of obeying this command, I'm probably going to always lean toward not wanting to rock the boat too much. You know, I, I'm going to want to lean toward not drawing the line as much. Now, some people are on the opposite side, and you guys might need to, you know, chill out a bit. You guys enjoy rocking the boat a little bit too much. That, that's another issue to talk about. But because of my tendency of not rocking the boat as much, the question I'm probably going to ask myself a lot is this. You know, is there a way to obey this command without creating too much pushback? Is there a way to obey this command without making it too hard on myself? And there could be, you know, there, there could be. But he, here's the thing. If you're like me and you lean toward that tendency to not wanting to rock the boat as much, we really need to hear what Paul has to say here in verse 20. Paul in verse 20 uh, gives the Roman Christians here a small kind of pep talk, right? An, an encouragement talk, you know. Don't be scared, he says. Remember, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. <laughs> that, that, that's a pep talk, okay? Now, look, if I got to give someone a pep talk before they go and do something, that should tell you that what they're about to do is probably going to be unavoidably hard, no matter how they do it, no matter how wisely and carefully they approach it. Or else you wouldn't really need a pep talk. Paul gave these Roman Christians a pep talk, almost like he's saying, look, if it's good, 
that you're kind and humble. It's good that you want to figure out how to do this well, cordially, right, without rocking the boat too much. That's good. But look, no matter how careful and wise and nuanced you are about doing this, it's just going to be hard. There's just no way around it. There's just going to be many moments that people will rail on you, accuse you of being hateful, accuse you of being too doctrinal, too prideful, too divisive. And that's going to be hard. It's going to be hard because if they're wrong, well, that's hard, right? Because then I'm being um, falsely accused. That's hard. But if they're right, that's hard too. Because if they're right, that means that I need to humble myself and repent of those sins that has surfaced in the process of me trying to obey this command. Either way, it's going to be hard. And you need to cling on to these two promises that, that Christ will win at the end. You're okay. It's okay. And that he is with you right here, right now. You need to remember those two promises amidst other people's sins who are falsely accusing you and amidst your own sin that's coming out to the surface as you try to obey this command. Be patient with them. Be patient with yourself. Forgive and endure them. Be kind to yourself and learn to repent when necessary. But keep going. Keep doing it. Keep fine-tuning it. Keep trying to figure it out, how to draw that line well, when, with what intensity. Keep trying to figure it out for the purity of the gospel message. It depends on it. Other Christians are figuring out as well. Paul says here uh, at the end of the uh, letter in verses 21 and 23. Timothy's doing it. One of my disciples, Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, other Christians. Tertius as well, who's the guy who's writing um, this letter down for Paul. Right. That's why in verse 23, if you look at it, it says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. It doesn't mean that Tertius is the author of this letter because in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul says he's the author of the letter. So Paul here is dictating it, and Antertius is, is writing it down for Paul, right? Gaius is here, Erastus is here, and a few other people. Then at the closing, very last part of the letter, Paul encourages them one more time, verse 25 and 27. Paul gives the Roman Christians a benediction. You know how at the end of our worship services, we, have a, we close with a benediction, right? That, that's what Paul does here. He ends the letter with a benediction, and let's just read it. Let me just read Paul's benediction for the Roman Christians. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings have been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, what's interesting about this benediction, there's a lot of benedictions throughout the Bible, but what's interesting about this one is that Paul here uh, specifically repeats all the themes that he already mentioned in the beginning of the letter in chapter 1. Okay, if you read that benediction again, you'll see the theme of Christ being able to save you through the gospel. He already said that in chapter 1, verse 4. Uh, the theme of being strong in the gospel, Paul already said that in chapter 1, verse 11. Uh, the theme of being in the gospel to the nations, Paul already said that in chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, you can go on here. There's a lot of uni unity and similarity. And the point here is that Paul is ending the letter in the same way that he begun, with the gospel. It's everything, Paul is saying. It's everything. It's the beginning. It's the end. And it's the only way to make sense of the messy middle. So since this is the last sermon in the series, and I really don't know when I'm ever going to preach on Romans again as a whole series of ever, right? Let's just do a quick recap and see how the gospel that Paul started and closed with is actually the focus of the whole letter. Chapter 1 and 2. How can someone as sinful as you and I be forgiven? The gospel. Chapter 3 to 5. What's the Old Testament about? The gospel. Chapter 6 to 7, how can you be released from the guilt of your past, present, and future sins? The gospel. Chapter 8 to 11, how do you know that the eternal God will eternally keep you? 
forever and never let you go. The gospel. Chapter 12 to 15, why should you now offer up your bodies as living sacrifices to the Lord? Serve Christ, even if it means sacrifice. The gospel. Finally, chapter 16, why should you fellowship with many Christians and endure the cultural differences and confusion that you may experience for the sake of the advancement of the gospel? And then today, why must you also at times draw the line and avoid some to keep the purity of the gospel? The gospel is found in every page of this letter. Why? Because it's in every inch of Paul's heart. Why did he write this letter in the first place? To strengthen the Roman Christians in the gospel. You know, because he wanted to eventually come and visit them. Why did he want to visit them? Because he needed to stop by Rome on his way to Spain. Why was he going to Spain? Because he wanted to share the gospel with people in Spain. It's everything. It's everything. You cut open Paul's heart, you'll see the cross everywhere. And did you know, Paul did eventually get to Rome. He did. He wrote this letter. Then a few years later, he, he went to Rome on his way to Spain. But, but he never made it to Spain because he was beheaded in Rome. Uh, in Rome and by Nero in 65 AD, around then, Paul was, was martyred, was, was beheaded. The gospel turned Paul's life upside down. It dictated the direction of his whole life, and it eventually cost him everything. See, most of us, we really haven't caught the gospel like Paul did. Oh no, what we've caught is a gospel vaccine. You know what a vaccine does, don't you? It gives us just enough of something so that we don't truly get fully infected by it. So we go to church and we sing the songs and we treat these weekly routines as weekly vaccines, but we never truly experience the fullness of its power like Paul did here. It's been a whole year now since we opened up and studied this letter. It's been a whole year since we opened up and studied Paul's heart. I can only pray that the Lord of all mercy would use my efforts, Joe's efforts, Sam's efforts in preaching this book in ways that is beyond our ability and that he would himself infect you with the gospel, the same one that turned Paul's life upside down. As we close this series, I thought, it would be appropriate for me to end by reading you uh, the end of the book of Acts, where Paul finally made it to Rome, and he's put in home arrest for two years. That eventually led to his beheading. And this is what Paul was seen doing at the very end of his life. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. The gospel is everything for him. This is the life that Paul is calling the Roman Christians to join him in. And this is the life that Paul is calling us today who read this letter to join him in as well. Will we join him? I pray we will. Let's pray. Father, what a rich book full of not only theological truths, but also a radical call to live as, as Paul did, who really counted the gospel not to be a fairy tale, but true. Because if it is true, then like Paul, we should say, even if the whole realm of nature mine, that'd be an offering far too small. Take our lives, Father, and use it for the purposes of your glory. Let every second of it, every penny of it, every loves that we have be so infiltrated by the gospel that we would live um, in, in, in holy obedience to it. 
and abandoned for it. For the sake of your name, the one who deserves all glory, honor, and power. And in your name alone we pray, Jesus. Amen. Friends, I, I pray that uh, studying this whole book this past year has really brought you closer to Christ, ha has really um, made you answer, uh, answer some questions you might have had or given you more questions uh, uh, that you may need to look for answers for. That's great. I hope it's uh, disrupted you when, where you need to be disrupted. I hope also it's comforted you when you need to be comforted. Um, join today. Uh, ask the ask the preacher at 3 p.m. Uh, to dialogue more about this letter, about this book. But all in all, I pray that, that it's allowed the gospel to, to just take one deeper root in your heart and really uh, change your life uh, for the better. 
All right. Uh, as we close, I'm not going to close with the normal benediction that, that I've been doing usually from, from numbers. Um, I'm going to do the benediction that Paul did here at the end of this letter that we just, we just read. I think that's appropriate. So friends, receive now uh, as we close this, this series in the book of Romans. Your benediction from Paul at the end of Romans. To him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen.